Hey, mate, 40 here. So I'm only live streaming tonight instead of kicking back, watching the football with the sound off, listening to Michael Wolf's biography of Rupert Murdoch on Audible and enjoy some high quality football. But I'm ticked off because I was trying to help somebody out today and I did what he asked, but much of what he asked me to do, he doesn't recollect uh, correctly. And it's just so frustrating. Like I, I followed directions. I was trying to help some dude out and uh, it did not go well. Bloody hell. So, so I wanted to come online and I just want to yell at somebody. Uh, you, you notice a lot of live streamers, right? They, they, they seem to get uh, a great deal of power. They get to, you know, vent a lot of uh, frustrations in their life by just yelling at somebody. And uh, Chris Kavanaugh made this point rather profoundly on decoding the gurus. I've already said this many times. We're going to do like some of the streamers, Destiny, Hassan Abi, these type of people, because it's an interesting ecosystem. And it's uh, an ecosystem which is rife with parasocial manipulations and, and egomaniacs running wild. So it's, it's a good location for secular gurus. But uh, yeah, it, it, the result is that I ended up watching these, they're called drama channels, Matt. Like they're basically like, they're YouTube channels which exist to, to talk about YouTube drama, like between creators, this kind of thing. Oh, okay. And yeah, yeah. Uh, not the worst of them, not like not like the ones that are completely like, uh, what's the equivalent in the old media? Like, um, what do you call that TV? Oh, that channel is just all about celebrities. Like, who, what are you wearing on the red carpet? And, yeah. you know, ETB or something like that? Yeah. Like I Paris Hilton? Is there a thing called like TZ or something? Or... Oh, TMZ. Yeah, TMZ. TMZ. Yeah. yeah. So there's like YouTube channels like that. The channels that I saw are not that bad, but they're kind of like, here is some bad creator. Look at all the bad things he does. It's like sounded familiar in some ways. But, um, uh, yeah, so I was just watching videos of that, Matt, and it, it's just those ecosystems, those personalities, they're, they're egomaniacs. And the way that they're interacting with their audience, like, you know, they sit on the stream and they're, they're kind of drinking their coffee or whatever, <laughs> like what I'm going to be doing in a minute. But then they, when somebody says something they don't like, it depends on the creator, but they get like, what? You fucking idiot. You just, you know, you stupid blah, blah. And they're just, you know, blah, 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 and getting all animated. And that's part of the appeal. But like, obviously the other person is generally not there, right? They're just like a disembodied Yeah. Tech. So you just, it's like a really one-sided, it's like a guru telling his followers off for daring to, you know, yeah. judgment. And I get yeah. really Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that's interesting, isn't it? So like they've written a little text or a comment and then they get- Like this? Get, get it would used. be like, yeah. you know, what's like, hey, what? Mooncat? What the fuck? Shut up, Mike Hickman. Like, you're an idiot. You just want to genocide the world, you stupid mar Right? It's like that. And mm. then, the, but obviously they have, you know, huge chats, so just like a kind of interacting with a wall of text, but it, I, as I mentioned to you, I previously saw Stefan Molyneux's um, interactions with his audience, and it was very mm. similar, very, very mm. similar dynamic. He would do call-in shows where people would call him in and ask for advice. And as soon as they said something he didn't like, he'd be like, mm. yeah, that's why you're in this situation. This is why, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it, it... Yeah, but uh, people only abuse you really to the extent that you sign off on it, right? You generally sign off when other people lie to you and abuse you because you've given out that energy that you can be abused, that you can be taken advantage of, that you you know, want to be deceived so that you can live in your delusions. Not 100%. I'm just saying that we play a significant role in how other people interact with us. So I got taken for hundreds, even thousands of dollars of scams when I was trying to make my way in Hollywood, checking out uh, the acting world in 1994, 95, because those people met my needs to feel like I could be a star. Yes, these are my real teeth. I've never had braces. they never had uh, fake teeth. These are just my, my real fair dinkum teeth. But I, I wear this retainer that brings my lower jaw forward. But in the process, it has widened the, the teeth in my lower, my lower mandible, I think that's called. So I have, I have gaps now in my lower teeth, but I, I keep wearing this retainer retainer at night because it brings the lower jaw forward and that's supposed to help open up the nasal passages or stuff like that but yeah i get you know more likely to get teeth stuck in and the the, the bottom row is not as uh, clean and straight and compact as it was before i started in with this uh, particular retainer that just brings my my lower jaw forward but I, I identify with this right i i had one girlfriend who i yelled at to the best of my knowledge there's only ever been one girlfriend who i yelled at but there's something about the dynamic of our relationship that kind of led me to yell at her i'm not proud of that i'm embarrassed about it but i would yell at her when we were driving down the freeway but she played a role in that and i played a big role in that and if people yell at you abuse you and lie to you on a regular basis there's probably something that you're doing and like it's a very dangerous thing to help somebody all right, because the need to be rescued 
and the need to rescue usually come out of the same sick place. Now, there's healthy helping of people and there's unhealthy, right? I remember I ran into this Holocaust survivor on a walk and he talked to me about how lonely he was and how, you know, it would just make his life if I would come visit him in the evenings. So I decided to come visit him in the evenings. All he wanted to do was to be left alone to watch Fox News, right? He, he wanted no interactions. I, I, you know, visited him one, two, three evenings, and he made it clear he was not interested in my company. So uh, people are complicated. Some people will, you know, call you up and tell you about their suicidal ideation. They will cry, cry, cry a river to you on the phone if you allow that. I, I don't think, generally speaking, it's a healthy thing to subsidize that, that sort of behavior. And uh, this can happen with the uh, live streamers too. You can develop a relationship with a live streamer where they yell at you. And really, that's that's in in part on on you. It just feels really, it just feels very um, like traditional guru dynamics. You know, like cult. Does it actually help bringing my lower jaw forward to open up my nasal passages so I sleep better? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But uh, do you remember when I used to do a lot of live streams with Dennis Dale? He's the only person. So the best of my knowledge that I frequently yelled at. So there, there had to have been something about the dynamic between Dennis Dale and myself that I would speak to him in a more harsh tone than I would, I think, more than any other regular on my show. So there's something about that relationship, that long, long, long uh, dead relationship with Dennis Dale that uh, often brought out, you know, really not nice part of myself. Yeah. Dennis would have a reflex of saying, I'm sorry. And I think the more Dennis said, I'm sorry, the more I yelled at him. And then the first time Ricardo called in, it was to say, Dennis, you got to stop saying, I'm sorry. And Dennis, Ricardo didn't say this, but if you keep saying, I'm sorry. And if you keep like taking unnecessary blame on yourself, then people will just keep blaming you and yell at you. Right. So on the one hand, it sounds like a great thing to do is like take responsibility. Oh, that's all my fault. I'm sorry. That's totally my fault. But you can go too far with that. You can abuse that. You can, you know, go, you know, to, to an extreme with that. And it becomes an unhealthy relationship dynamic that you're assembling with people so that they just feel, you know, totally free to blame you for all sorts of things that aren't fully your fault and to start yelling at you and disparaging you. And you played a role. I play a role in many people treating me with, with disrespect because I am maladaptively vulnerable. I like way too vulnerable. I, I think I become too vulnerable to, I don't know, get out of, you know, complicated or demanding situations to create drama, to try to create, you know, undue intimacy and intensity in my relations, just try to, you know, make a shortcut to have good relations with people to wear my heart on the sleeve. And in the process, I am just way too vulnerable. And then people, frequently treat me with disgust or just disrespect. And I am inviting that. All right. I've got this habit of being overly vulnerable and then I don't like the results of that. Leadership. Yeah. Um, like you, you single people out for bastardization, right? It's yeah. Kind of, it's, it is like a, a very old fashioned um, social control technique where if there's got a big group of people, you, the, the big boss person will pick someone out and, and yeah, yeah. bastardize them essentially. And everyone else kind of observes and kind of um, gets a bit of a thrill from, from, Right. If people are picking you out to yell at, there's a good chance that you played a significant role. When I have told my friends how various employers or employers at the time were treating me, most of my friends who are high functioning said, I would not put out with that for 30 seconds. But I put out the vibe that I could be abused because I was used to that because I was bounced off the walls growing up. You know, I was smacked around. I was used to, to being abused. So even into my 50s, I, I being abused by people in authority felt normal, natural, felt like I was at home when someone was berating me, deriding me, cutting me down for, for no good purpose, you know, just treating me terribly. That felt like our home, right? We, we learn certain patterns, certain habits, certain things that feel comfortable to us. And I learned in my childhood that being abused, being smacked around verbally and physically, that felt like home to me. I remember I used to do one of these podcast shows 20 years ago, and my co-host James DeGiorgio said you'd make a good, you'd make it, you'd be a battered husband. You'd just be a classic battered husband, and all you'd do is would be whine and complain about it. And uh, various pornographers who, who specialize in sadomasochism were, were able to very quickly point out that I had a fetish for being, you know, verbally hurt. 
I had a fetish for basically encouraging people to treat me with disrespect. And consciously, no, you know, I hate being treated with disrespect. I hate being hurt. But I would consistently act and invite that sort of behavior. Not being the one being yeah, classified. Like it's, yeah. Scott Adams did it, right? We've heard it, Scott Adams doing that in some of his content. But, it, but the thing is, lots of these people are doing that in their, and their politics are all over the map. Like Hassan Avi is like a leftist, right? And the, the, it's so it's, this is actually useful for us because we can saying, you know, it would be good to look at uh, people from the left side of the spectrum. And the problem is most of the IDW types, they almost all identify as centrists or, or left-leaning people, but like they're not, they're not really, right? But there are left-leaning people doing the parasocial exploitative stuff, but I think a lot of them hang out on YouTube and Twitch. So yeah, we, we might find them there. Uh, so yeah, the more, anyway. The more, I, the more I hear about this internet thing, Chris, the less I care for it. <laughs> yeah, it's a bad idea. <laughs> I also <laughs> saw a message. You know that thing that went viral a while back where you have the TikTokers or whatever, the TikTokers and the Twitches where they're, they're kind of doing reactions when people pay like money. They're saying, yum, yum, like ice cream yeah, or whatever, yeah. right? Yum, yum. Uh, but yes. what somebody pointed out is like, if you don't watch the stream, quite for a large part of that stream they're doing the um like just waiting animation <laughs> like they're because they're not being paid money all the time right so they a lot of it they just have like a you know like mpc resting face movement which they're just doing it's fucking right you can throw down super chats i'm rumble right now i'm on rumble backslash luke ford and uh throw down a super chat i'll say yum 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 so the, <laughs> until they get a reaction then they you know it's like somebody putting the money into the machine and the thing yeah. comes to life but you're like but you're not a npc right you're not a computer <laughs> you're, you're a human being <laughs> what's so happening it's, so it's weird isn't it it's, it's like pure objectification right like there isn't necessarily a, a sexual component because people usually use that Except word in relation to that attractive the, they are very attractive right ones, but yeah. but i think the key th i think if it is like that it is abstracted away to such a weird degree that who knows what it's what it's tickling but it's it's clearly objectification right the person is acting like a robot like an anime character and mm. they're responding just like if you press a button you put the coin in the slot that's just so odd yeah, <laughs> it's all right so the the chat says you know i whack off this is a, a woman saying i whack off to the idea of my boyfriend cheating on me in real life i would never, never you know in real life get get off on that so yeah we all have a dark side and I was just talking to a sponsee about this a, a few minutes ago. All that, our self-destructive, maladaptive behaviors like me being overly vulnerable, that's meeting a real need, right? The reason that we are maladaptively doing things is because we are not meeting our needs through our regular life. So why am I going around making myself like way too vulnerable for my own good? Because in all likelihood, I'm not meeting sufficiently my needs for intimacy uh, intense connection with other people through healthy ways. So I'm using unhealthy ways to try to meet those needs. I mean, uh, other blokes, they're not getting their intimacy needs and their needs for like intense closeness with people. So they're, you know, going to glory holes or bathhouses or, you know, hiring prostitutes or looking at pornography or getting high or doing drugs, right? So we have legitimate needs. If we don't meet our legitimate needs legitimately in healthy ways, like through our, say, 12-step recovery program, or through our religion, through our, through our yoga, through our spiritual practices, all right, we're going to meet them in a sick way. So I have a need for drama. Uh, and so I, I think I, I make myself unnecessarily vulnerable. I try to create inappropriately intense relationships in, in many contexts. I like to, you know, play, play a lot of games with the uh, some some people in my life because I, I like to feed you know my my need for you know for, for drama but there are healthy ways to feed my need for drama such as by doing these informative provocative enthralling entertaining uh, live streams that's like a healthier way for me to meet my need for drama I I have a great need for freedom and so I have consistently self sabotaged uh, relationships uh, work situations communal communal situations so that I could feel free. Because all human inter interactions are going to get messy. Like all human interactions are going to touch on parts of you that feel awkward and that you don't want to be reminded that you have these vulnerabilities. And so I have consistently in the course of my life, you know, wanted to just drop, you know, flames and petrol and gasoline and s cigarettes and, and lighters and just blow things up so that I could feel free again because I was feeling hemmed in, uh, captured, uh, you know, parts of me were feeling very awkward because of some, you know, ongoing interaction I had, such as a job or friendship or a communal relationship. So instead, I can healthfully create that feeling of freedom by saving money, by overcoming my various emotional addictions, 
by setting aside time for myself and for doing what I want, uh, getting clear about what's important to me and pursuing those goals. Okay, so yeah, if we if we don't meet our needs through healthy ways, we're going to meet them through very sick, you know, maladaptive ways. But when we find out we we're stuck in some you know self destructive pattern, we have to ask like, what legitimate, what real needs is this meeting? How is this seemingly self destructive maladaptive trait, character trait, behavior, habit pattern? How is that serving me? Then how is it hurting me? How would I benefit from being in the opposite of it? After like hipster scene. In, in London, before like it, it had kind of emerged from what it is. So it's Charlie Brooker, like uh, doing a very dark comedy about like yeah, a guy dealing with like you know basically Vice and magazines like that, and uh, just noticing how like superficial stupid and everything is. Very good. Only six episodes I think ever made, but very good. What's it, what's it called again? Tell me the tell me the title. Nathan Barley. Nathan Barley is in Barley. Barley, Barley, like the way he speaks there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nathan Barley. It's very good. If you like dark and stuff, you'll, you'll like that. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Look, see, Brian is right. Um, it is true, and I was going to point this out, Like, oh yeah, friends, yeah, 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 David Brian. And look, I'll, I'll give you a theory of comedy that helps you here, Matt. Like Basil Fawlty and stuff. They, you know, they are in the lineage of that, right? A, a bit more of yeah. commentary, but the whole point is yeah. kind of even Dad's Army and stuff like that. In, uh, you know, the kind of Isn't that... whoops, I, I pushed the push the wrong link. Here we go. Oh, it's, it's Mark right. Klingman... I know I'm sounding more and more like a boomer, but it's all the story. Well, Mark Mark Klingman is making a good point that like you know you have the people in the street performers, right, who are dressed up like statues and move yeah, around when yeah, you put them on the end. That's true. That's, uh, that's yeah, true. but there's As something people don't think there's anything creepy about the street performers acting like statues. <laughs> they're, they're, they're they're objectifying. <laughs> they're that, like no, I, they're, I, they're I, a little bit creepy. Mine's are creepy. <laughs> yeah, there's there's something about that where it's I guess I guess this is it. Unfortunately, you're right, Mark. That that is probably a good... right. I have a need to perform. Right, if I don't perform on YouTube, all right, I might perform in some very inappropriate places in inappropriate ways with inappropriate audiences with inappropriate levels of audience interaction with my performances good analogy that this is just the online version of that but it's just so fucking weird so weird um what do i use to groom my beard so precisely okay and i was up uh went to bed at seven and uh, got up at three thirty-seven a.m this morning i, I not sure I got this queued up right. I sure hope this is correct. Actually, hold on, because I've listened to that, and I think he knows Arabic, or he knows, you know, he definitely knows Arabic speakers. But he said, "Ah, yeah, this is, this is, this is good. This is really good." From decoding the gurus, Chris Cavanaugh, Matt Brown. Record a, a interview with Dag Soros, the Norwegian comedian, for his podcast. I don't think it's. I yeah, I definitely talked about this with him. Um, but uh, and I told you about this, right? So it you'll, and it will come up if we do the Sam Harris episode. But um. Sam was talking about people may or may not have heard this recording of a Hamas terrorist calling his family back in Gaza and kind of proudly talking uh, about yeah. all the um, yeah. people that he's killed. And um, the transcript of the conversation, uh, like one, it's very clear that the Hamas guy is very proud of killing the Israeli civilians. He's telling people, look on the phone, you can see the 10 Jewish people I killed with my own hands. I killed them. You know, this is great. It's, uh, and, but the, re the additional layer that was added onto that analysis is that the parents and the family seem happy and they're not responding in horror, right? So this is more horrific because it's somebody describing doing horrific actions, but their family are not reacting in horror. And, and this is a potential concern because it would speak to like- All right, so most people, their thinking just goes down certain tracks. They get certain stimuli and then they just, you know, inevitably go down a certain track. They don't really take the time to consider what's, what's really going on. They just seize what's immediately appealing and feeds their needs. The level of um, like, uh, radicalization yeah, yeah, right. in the general community but yep. when sam raised this so if you look at the transcript there are very things where the parents say things like uh you know uh, praise be the allah or something like this right and graham wood the journalist who has more specialism in this said whenever sam raised this topic with him said actually hold on because so graham wood wrote a profile of richard spencer he kind of specializes in jihadi terrorism he's a, a thoughtful thoughtful journalist Right, for the Atlantic. I've listened to that, and I think he knows Arabic, or he knows, you know, he definitely knows Arabic speakers, but he said, I actually think that, that you're misinterpreting that, because if you listen, they are using stock phrases that you hear, you know, the same way someone might say Jesus Christ, or oh my God, right, but they're not invoking praise be to the most high Jesus Christ, right, I say it, but it, it's because of the, you know, Islamic culture, just there's lots of stock phrases that reference uh, Allah, or whatever the case might be, um, and then Graham Wood says, to me, it sounds like they're reacting out of disbelief and shock, and they're kind of saying, what are you talking about? Like, you know, where are you? What's going on? Oh, and, and like, instead of it being praise be the Allah, it's like, praise, praise be the Allah, you know, like Jesus Christ, what, what are you talking, you know? And yeah. the, the mom is crying at one stage and like Sam presented that as like tears of joy. It doesn't sound like that in the, but in any case, I don't know. So when I saw the transcript online, I had the same reaction of Sam, like initially, where I was like, oh, this looks um, concerning, right? That there isn't the agreed. But then when I heard somebody who knows a bit about the topic and, and might understand the language better, raise that actually it's a misinterpretation. I thought, oh, I don't know. Yeah. I, yeah. Now I, I, I shouldn't pass judgment, and that is plausible. But Sam, in the next 
episode that they released, uh, does a long segment with the same interpretation that they initially had of the call. And at the very end, he says, a Graham Wood has an alternative, but I'm not so sure about that or something. And, yeah. and, it moves on. and it's like, wow. Like, yeah. It, it, yeah, it just speaks to his thinking being on rails. And, you know, we're, we're dunking on sand, but there's like a general principle to be absorbed here, right? Which is that when you've got too strong, uh, you could call it ideological, you could call it theoretical, but you've got too strong a mental framework that you wanted to filter all the information yeah. through, then what, what you clearly do is you just ignore the disconfirming evidence that doesn't fit and, and, you, and, and you persist with a model as if all the evidence that's coming in is fitting your model perfectly. And that makes you unable to, to learn new things, basically. And it becomes kind of boring. Because yeah, one thing that Yuval uh, was emphasizing in that conversation was like, you know, there's religious extremists on the Israeli side, right? The ones who are promoting the West Bank settlement and actually a lot of Netanyahu's government, right? <laughs> like he was appealing to the far right of Israeli politics and the, the ones that um, are, are at least supporting. I think that phrase, thinking on rails, since I heard it this morning, it just hasn't left my head. I, I think it's a really useful way of understanding some very common human tendencies. ...by religious demagogues. And, but the way Sam had phrased, framed that was, you know, that kind of one side has the religious fanatics and the other yeah, side is... Doesn't, uh, like, yeah, there's none yeah. of that. Just, just, and, just an ideal secular democracy. No, yeah, no and, but so the, the position, though, was just it's just more reasonable to... I'm not saying that, therefore, it's completely equivalent, right? But it, it's more like... And... Uh, Comment in the chat from Hasidic Bell Daphine. These guys, according to the gurus, are the worst. I don't know why Luke likes these insufferable morons. So boring. All right. They're, they're not as exciting as a Nick Fuentes or Richard Spencer and Ethan Ralph. Uh, frequently, the truth, frequently profound truth, is not immediately exciting. It's not uh, a thrill. But I, I think that what they have to say is incredibly important here. It's complex. And there are religious extremists on both sides and there are moderating forces on, on, on both sides. And like that, yeah, the, 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 so basically the black and white, like it's just jihadism. That's the only ideology that we really have an, an issue with. And, you know, yeah, again, yeah. Uh, you've raised the point that like plenty of people in uh, the 20th century seem to do a lot of extreme activities for secular yeah, ideologies yeah. that didn't posit an eternal afterlife, right? Millions of people died in the furtherance of those objectives. So it's not that that isn't an ideology, martyrdom and, and so on, that is a problem, but it is that it's not the only potential driver for like conflicts and, you know, Ukraine and Russia, it's not relying on... It, uh, no, a fundamentalist thing. I mean, unless you try to shoehorn, you, know, right? you know, yeah, unless you try to shoehorn nationalism into that. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, reality is, you know, messy and complicated and that's deeply unsatisfying, I think, to, to everybody, right? It'd be really nice. It's really nice to have a nice, simple set of heuristics, a nice, simple, like, mental key that explains every problem. Like, wouldn't it be great if, you know, everyone that we covered, Chris, they're all bloody grifters. That's what it is. They're all grifting, right? They're, they're all grifters, right? Bang. You know, they're you know, if you want to, you know, if you wanted to, you could you pay attention to particular bits of evidence and that could be the, the, the key that explains everything yeah. that's happening in this sphere. But unfortunately not. It's a bit more complicated. Yes, it's an element. It's just one of many. Some of it hangs together comfortably. Other things just don't really fit. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Even even in the case of narcissism, which we often emphasize, yeah. right? like that you you could completely exercise that and focus on some other element. Like, like for example, the, the flows of money in the ecosystems. And I, I that wouldn't be wrong, right? It would be giving you a partial, partial. perspective. And the, the same thing would apply if you completely ignore the financial incentives that are in play and, and the network dynamics. So like, it's, yeah. yeah it, but I, I see that as well, actually. Sorry, well, now we <laughs> keep elaborating on this point, but you see it crop up in so many different ways. Like, I, like I've got a lot of friends online who fall into that kind of, you know, liberal free speech forever type Everybody. attitude, right? Yeah, so so they see, you know, you know, free speech as just this fundamental, you know, principle that is that is so important. Okay, I enjoyed that little burst there from Decoding the Gurus, also listening to the Duran, making the point that, that uh, we had a way out of this Ukraine crisis. We, we didn't have to get into this mess. Once we were into the mess, there was basically an agreement reached between Zelensky and Putin, but uh, the Biden administration and the Boris Johnson administration in Britain said to Zelensky, no way, you've got to get all your territory back. You can't compromise at all, even though we could have ended this war you know, shortly after it, it began. And so a lot of politicians like Joe Biden and the head of NATO, right, they have their egos on the line. They think it will be good for their reputation, right, for their career prospects to keep this bloody slaughter going on in Ukraine. This is from the Duran podcast. Between Kiev, which as we now know is a complete fiction. I mean, we discussed that before. The Russians withdrew as part of a diplomatic deal, which the West sabotaged. Um, they talk about Kharkiv and Kherson region of the Kharkiv offensives being reversed and the Kherson offensive is at a standstill and the losses Ukraine suffered as a result of those were horrendous but the realities today on the battlefronts anyway are completely different but Stoltenberg he won't talk about that Annalena Baerbock won't talk about that what she's doing instead is warning people about not being fatalistic about Ukraine that they want must get on 
still supporting Ukraine, giving Ukraine everything so that it can continue the war until it is finally destroyed. Uh, I mean, the Russians say, you know, that it's until the last Ukrainian, and that's what it's beginning to look like. Yeah, yeah it's almost like they want to, I guess it's like destroying the scene of the crime, I guess. You know, they just, I think Stoltenberg, von der Leyen, Annalena, Zelensky, Yermak, all these people, they're so up to, up to their neck in, in so much just, just crap, you know, just nasty crap that they just, they, they decided, let's just, Destroy the whole thing, and, and Russia did it. Exactly. And, and blame that's, it all on, that's what they're blame doing. It all, blame yeah. it all on Putin. Blame it all on the Russians. Uh, when Ukraine is destroyed, all this, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have been killed. It's all Putin's fault. And because it's all Putin's fault, we must take even more steps to insulate and protect and defend Europe from them and clamp down even more on anybody in Europe who says otherwise. So that 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 is the agenda now. Yeah, let me just uh, just to wrap up the video. Let me read you a quote, and I want your your thoughts, your human psychology right. uh, input. So uh, so much of the drive for suppressing speech online and accusing anyone who differs from the you know ruling regime with regard to incentivizing and subsidizing Ukraine's war with Russia is oh we, you know we need to restrict speech so that uh, we don't give soccer to our enemies so we we create this horrific situation in Ukraine and then try to restrict speech so that uh, those who are subsidizing and directing this horrific situation in Ukraine uh, they get more protection from being criticized. On this, just so we understand how these people think. And this has to do with Brexit, but you know, I, I, think you'll be, I think you'll be able to relate this to Ukraine. So uh, Ursula von der Leyen, she gave an interview or made some comments about Brexit and how the UK is, is now looking to, to move back into, into the European Union. That's the, traje the trajectory of things. And she said, she said this, I keep telling my children, and she's talking about Brexit, I keep telling my children, you have to fix it. We goofed up. You have to fix it. So I think here too, the direction of travel, my personal opinion is clear. I, I just read that quote, we goofed up. And I just think, you know, this is the way these people think. This is how yes. they're going to explain everything. When, when yes. it all collapses, it's just going to be like, you know. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on, on that? Just the, the psychology of these, these globalists and these, and these institutions, is, is, it, it just sickens you. But anyway, that's, that's how they see the world. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the, that, that is exactly what they're going to do. You know, we acted out of good faith. It was a mistake. We made, we made mistakes, as we did with Iraq, as we did with Libya. But we acted with the best of intentions all along. And if everything in the end turned out bad, well, it was not our fault. It was because there wasn't enough uh, uh, will and determination. People didn't give as much money as they should have done. They didn't give as much weapons as they should have done. They could have given more. Never explained how that could have happened. And of course, in the end, in this particular crisis, uh, it's absolutely not our fault. It's the fault of the horrible man in the Kremlin and these terrible people around him, Putin and his accomplices. They are the people who ruined our beautiful dream. And, you know, we... The only responsibility you take is that you made certain mistakes. You goofed. You goofed up. You still want all those hundreds of thousands of students and women to go to the battlefronts. That's, but that's only a mistake if they had died. It's only a mistake on your part if they, if they died. I mean, it's good that we make these programs now because um, when those excuses are made. Right. This war would not have happened if Donald Trump had been in the White House. I don't think there would have been a massive Hamas attack on Israel and therefore an Israeli invasion of Gaza if Donald Trump had been in the White House. And we've been unnecessarily provocative with China over Taiwan. We could get into an absolute mess there as well. This is the, the most seemingly competent, but really the most incompetent foreign policy administration that uh, the United States has had in 70 plus years. We have programs like this as a public record of what it was really, of what it really all amounted to. Before we finish, just wanted to say, I noticed that in Britain, and I mentioned it on my uh, program uh, for my own channel yesterday, they're now resurrecting the story that um, it was actually Putin who turned down the prospects of peace last year. That there was this mysterious deal that nobody knows anything about that was negotiated with Kozak, you know, Kozak, Putin's um, official, that he did some kind of a deal with the Ukrainians uh, and, and that Putin rejected it. There is absolutely, just to say again, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever for that story, but it again tells you that deep down, the British know full well what they actually did in March and April of last year when they knocked away the chance Ukraine had to agree to a peace um, we see the same comments now being made by Aristovich. Aristovich has confirmed, has confirmed that as well, that Ukraine had a good peace deal then, and it was all thrown away. And the he, British he said very good, very, very good. favorable peace deal, yeah, he said. Exactly. He actually said the exactly. Russians made a lot of concessions. Sorry, exactly. That's what he said. exactly, exactly. So a very, very good peace deal was made last year. The British played an instrumental role in throwing it away. But they're, they're starting to get nervous that people are start, going to start pointing the fingers at them. So they're now falling back again on this fictitious story about this other deal that was supposed to what do I make about all the assassination talk uh, with regard to Donald Trump? Well, I think the Atlantic, didn't they just have something like 40 
different intellectuals write essays and why it'd be a disaster to have uh, Donald Trump as the next president of the United States. So, yeah, there's uh, there there are all these incentives being laid, just like there were incentives laid for the massive increase in violent crime we've had since George Floyd. We have all these incentives laid for an assassination of Donald Trump. I think, you know, that that ground is is being prepared. Okay, let's uh, get a little bit of a lighter note. This is Tim Heidecker on Joe Rogan. Look at the Joe Rogan clip. The cuz again, stop if Joe Rogan, if you want to be an expert on this, stop doing your silly show. With your Fud Ruckers background. I'm a fatty, fat, fat, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's Joe. For young boys in particular, there's an adverse risk associated with the vaccine. It's like yes. a two to four fold increase in the instances of myocarditis. Yes, but you know what? Hospitalization. The, you know that there's COVID. an increased risk of myocarditis in, among that age cohort from getting COVID as well, which exceeds uh, the risk of myocarditis from the vaccine. I don't think that's true. I don't think it it's is. true. He doesn't think no, it's no, true, no. guys. It's true that there's an increased well, who are you? risk of myocarditis from people catching COVID that are young versus increased risk of myocarditis from the vaccine. Look at you. No, Look, let's pause. There's Listen both. to this. Joe You're Rogan so saying myocarditis. Car- 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 what? Right. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> well, why should I? I just go to the Wait, doctor, Joe, and, I t- and the doctor tells me what to do. Right. And no, hopefully it all works out for the best. Right. There is. There's both. Pro- well, let's look that up, because I don't think that's <laughs> let's true. Look that- Where are you looking it up? In the New England Journal of Medicine? But is this with children? In Grey's Anatomy? What? Some fucking website. Yeah, we're talking about young like, people. The, they boys, go down this route. They, they're lost. They're just lost. With, with children. Because there's so much issue. information. Well, no, right? we're right. 15 years. There's so much well, information. And so poor Joe Rogan, right. his, his brain's just <laughs> melting with all this information. He can't dissect it. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Joe, if you want to be an expert on this subject, stop doing your daily dumb show where you talk to fucking whoever, some. Dick comedian who's, who's, you know, talking about whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a, something there. What, who's Ted, he talking uh, to? Ted Nugent. Ted Nugent about hunting <laughs> and goggles and everything and eating meat. Stop your show. Go enroll at Austin University's medical <laughs> fucking university, right? And Can become just- a doctor. Yeah, good, uh, good question in the chat from Elliot Blatt. Why did certain countries like Sweden and Denmark and uh, I believe the state of Queensland in Australia banned the Moderna vax citing myocarditis because there were studies revealing that there was a chance of some kind of myocarditis uh, reaction among a tiny, tiny number of people to the vaccine. What these countries did not take into adequate account is that the risks of myocarditis are much, much higher for people who catch COVID. So people see a risk with doing a certain procedure and they go, oh, we should, we should not have that procedure done. What they frequently don't consider is what's the risk if you don't do the procedure or you don't take the, the vaccine or if you, you know, don't engage in that activity. Yeah, everything comes with a risk. One needs to make uh, prudent choices on uh, what type of risk you want to take. This is Tim Heidecker on Bill Maher. The, what's, what, what is the part of it that, that bums you out the most? The part that gets me is seeing a casual Bill Maher where – yeah. He's got the the T shirt yeah, underneath the, the button down shirt, and you know it's very it, close to the Steve Buscemi, uh, you know, hey kids. Yeah, exactly. Look. Like he's, and then that sad table with the just packed to the gills. Everything's re- ready to yeah. fall o- fall over. But it's all, and it's also just and the like clinking. Yeah, he's like reaches over. There's so he's so, like a real compulsion to like light things and po- and keep ice. moving. Yeah, he's yeah. Like, it, He'll be talking to you while yeah, yeah. doing. Well, he'll the whole... what he'll do is he'll ask a question. Mm-hmm. Let me see if I can do it here. <laughs> yeah. So, so what w- what have you been up to this summer? Well, you know, I've really been no, like... <laughs> like right as soon as the <laughs> as soon as the it's immediate. Yeah. Like you he should do it while still. he's talking. Yeah. You do it when you're exactly. So no. the little things like that are amazing, and then just his. His general point of view has mm-hmm. just turned into grumpy man, get yeah. off my lawn. Yeah. 
uh, and his un, he's not interested in what the other person has to say. No, he's, and he's combative. He's he's fighting. He's 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 closed shop in yeah. his head. Yeah. Everything I've come up with is the answer. Yes, the, the new the, rule has been no room stone, yeah. no room for anything else. And I'm going to be weirdly petulant yeah. about it that you might dare to not see it the way I see it. Yeah, and then the guests don't seem to know that, like, none of the guests have watched the show. They it, might, now they yeah. start have maybe yeah. caught up, but yeah. in the first bunch, you could feel that, that they were not expecting to be yeah. sabotaged like this. Where they're that, just they're like, pounced on. They're like, wait, this is what this is? Yeah. <laughs> I thought this was the HBO thing. Yeah. Like, they're checking the address, they're driving, like, yeah, I'm going to do Bill Maher's show. Yeah. And then suddenly yeah, they're, they're going they're, up a they're, hill. They're, they're like, going up turn like a, right. Yeah. Well, hey, <laughs> I'm going to CBS Television yeah. City or yeah, exactly. studio. They'll be like in the hills. They'll be just like <laughs> two tenths of a mile before I'm here. Where am I going? This has to be wrong. Okay. Some uh, interesting comments in the chat. Uh, here we go. Hasidic Bell Delphine. No one watches Luke Ford anymore because he hates his viewers and thinks that people like Douglas Murray, Murray is shallow. There's a lot of truth to that. I am not, you know, going to do a show uh, that uh, just panders to people's, you know, dumb uh, prejudices. I'm not going to do a show where I'm just telling you that, you know, you're so great and your favorite uh, right wing intellectuals are just amazing if they're not. And I'm not going to say that, uh, you know, the, the the deep state is, you know, responsible for you know most of the problems in our lives and. And the elite are trying to destroy Western civilization. I'm not going to give you that that crap. You've got hundreds of right wing shows that will just dish out the crap. All right, you want to be lied to. All right, you want to go on a live stream so that you can have, you know, some intellectual masturbation where just you know all your knee jerk 100 IQ prejudices are reinforced. There there are a lot of other shows that are much better for that than than this show. All right, we go deep here. Is there really inconclusive evidence that the vax actually prevented? Is there really conclusive evidence that the vax prevented COVID? Well, no one's smart. There are no scientific uh, studies, to the best of my knowledge, of any prestige arguing that the vax prevents COVID. What they argue is that it reduces the severity of COVID and reduces the transmission of COVID and uh, reduces infection rates with COVID. My entire family is vax, max, every single one got COVID. Yeah, so what? I mean, this is just reasoning from anecdote. Either COVID, reduces, COVID vaccines reduce the intensity of COVID, reduce death from COVID, reduce hospitalization from COVID, or it, it doesn't. And so it's just a matter of the, the studies. Yeah, the, the deep state supports this channel. Absolutely. Vaccines never promise immunity. All right, uh, vaccine eff efficacy lasts about eight weeks, says the, the chat. Well, there's some efficacy at reducing the severity of, of COVID and reducing the number of people who uh, even catch COVID and die from COVID. I think the evidence is, is pretty clear that uh, vaccines that are approved by the United States and other first world governments are overwhelmingly safe and are more effective than doing nothing. But I'm not an expert enough on vaccines, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna belabor that that point. I, I just simply don't know enough. But the the Duran's absolutely right. Thinking about you know how our, our leaders, for the sake of their own prestige and political prospects, have subsidized this war in Ukraine. And wouldn't you know it? Just as I go to play that link, uh, the player player crashes. All right, little bit of a. Discursion here by Chris Kavanaugh and Matt Brown on their favorite form of comedy. Well, 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 yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah. Um, here we British comedy. Um, I think it's my favorite brand of comedy. It's good. Yeah, American comedy. American comedy, like maybe 15, 20 years ago, it was fashionable in my circles here in Australia. But American comedy kind of kind of sucked a bit. I mean, maybe Seinfeld. This is this is what we used to say to each other. Seinfeld was not 10 years ago. No, I said I said 15 a while ago, but I was young. Okay, yeah, yeah. Just look at it and how long ago that was. It was it was a long time ago. It was a while ago. And how wrong we were. How wrong we were. American comedy is a renaissance. Yeah, a lot of people, including a lot of Americans, just have absolute contempt for America and for American culture and American comedy. And there's a lot of great American TV. There's a lot of great American culture. There are a lot of great things about America, just as there are great things about Britain and England and France and Denmark and Australia and New Zealand and Japan as well. But uh, 
I mean, Richard Spencer just has this knee-jerk contempt for, you know, all things American. But uh, America makes some... You know, pretty good comedy. Yeah. No, I, David, um, like I said, there's that, like, read that reason. There's so much edgy, weird stuff, like, that I think you should leave, guys. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that guy's good. They're, they're pretty good. You know, like, Even it's, Dave uh, Chappelle yeah. and all that were good. They're a little bit long in the tooth. I mean, a little bit long in the tooth. They're pretty, that's almost like watching a Joe Rogan special night. But, uh, uh, but still, stand up is good. There used to be this stereotype that American, amongst foreigners, foreign speaking, sorry, English speaking foreigners, that American comedy was kind of broad and obvious and whatever, at least, at least in my circles. Yeah, I guess yeah. so. Like, 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 yeah, that's a really common critique, uh, particularly among Australians and Europeans, that uh, American comedy is just broad and stupid. But then again, England had Benny Hill, so... Who, he just Did anyone watch Benny Hill? I never... I don't, I never nobody, nobody treated that as... No, that, that's such a, But, um, yeah, no, anyway, we're totally wrong. But there you go, America, cultural powerhouse. That's my... Yeah, uh, you come for the gurus, and instead you learn a lot about <laughs> British comedy. Uh, when I was a child, the gurus on Benny Hill gave me tingles. That is Chris Thanos saying that, not me. I was not mm -hmm. well, young enough to experience Benny Hill. You're all trash. Well, what, what, Chris, Chris, you must have... You must, you're, you're my age, aren't you? Well, close. Thereabouts. You must have watched the goodies. The goodies had... Uh, when I was a kid, there was no sense... They didn't have censorship. Yeah, okay, we're very close. Um. The goodies, like they didn't have, and Monkey Magic, Monkey Magic, Bethany Single, that they translated out of Chris. Yeah, like, I know. They didn't really have censorship for kids, so they, we, little kids got to, you know, there was, was titillating things during children's television. Well, yeah. I, 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 live in, changed. I live in Japan, Matt. There are plenty of titillating things on children's uh, programs. The, 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 they're, still, they're still holding on to that. To the, oh, yes, yeah, they, they are. It's quite amusing. The, the manga covers that my son, 10 year old son, has are a sight to behold. But, you know, is it unhealthy for him to be exposed to the existence of in human side press? I don't know. I don't know. I, I merely exist in the culture. I don't judge it. I'm an anthropologist. In that <laughs> You're an anthropologist, that's right. He's <laughs> an anthropologist. He just exists in the culture. He doesn't doesn't judge it. All right, a uh, little bit more from the getting well, the gurus. Foundations with it that you need to be sort of willing to at least pay lip service to a bunch of a bunch of stuff, which is kind of right on. And um, that's no problem for me personally. Talking about diversity and inclusion statements. <laughs> there are a few people who, who get on their high horse about it. So it's like I don't know. I mean, yeah. You're gonna push back that you have to pay lip service to anything because I guess you know when I get the DI statement from you guys or say y'all or the I'm sorry, uh, near the end of the I'm sorry, the man's name I forgot on the last page on the upload, but. Uh... I mean, also, you know, a decent DI thing would just be talking about your actual podcast, the fact that you know, you're spreading this academic knowledge to those people who are not in the academy. And But you are right that, you know, on some level, that is still just you needing to learn how to write to promote yourself, which is a big part of academia and grant writing in general. But also it's a part of, you know, another thing that those statements are meant to do, and again... So Chris Cavanaugh and Matt Brown, they, they met up on, on Twitter because they both ha were somewhat heterodox while loathing the intellectual dark web. So they're, they're basically center-left liberals who both tire of liberal-left hypocrisy, but also have disdain for the low IQ intellectual dark web. This is kind of just another hoop to jump through on some level, is the fact that you're meant to try to look at your past and align it with like the overall mission statement of the university, things like that. However, it's also important to note that part of your job as a professor is to do that at the national level when you're writing grants or international level. Like you need to look at the organizations like actual mission statement, what, you know, for like the national things in America that fund research, you need to look at, you know, this year, what are they really trying to hype up? And so on some level, needing to go to the school's website and look up all those things is selecting for someone who's going to be able to write good mm. grants. Uh, yeah. I, guess, I mean, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. So a lot of these tests, whether they're diversity and inclusion statements, they're really just tests. Are you willing to follow directions? Are you willing not to be a dick and to get along with people, all right? If you're gonna get along with people, you're gonna to have to go along with a lot of crap, all right? N not everyone else is gonna see things the way you do. I, I think you're right. I think, I think it does perform this function. And I've kind of said this before, which is I, I think, and this isn't really a dig, it's more just like a sociological observation that it is like, a, it is like back in the Victorian era where they would, sound, they would you know, people that wanted to become part of the British civil service and and get into that that the, the sort of rungs of power would get sounded out did they go to the right clubs and did they have the right opinions and whatever and i'm i'm not that sounds more pejorative than i mean it to be but i think there is some of that right so in, in a university um like if you want to become a dean or a deputy vice chancellor or whatever um a lot of it is like at, at our universities are corporations just like berkeley i assume and frankly they are they are primarily concerned with not having scandals not mm -hmm. not having people that mm -hmm. are going to become a massive problem and part of it is actually demonstrating that you're not going, that you're not a weirdo and you're not going to like swim against the stream and call. Right. This is like most jobs. The number one reason people get fired is they become seen as a liability. They're just weird off putting that uh, they make other people uncomfortable, that they're not willing to, you know, play nicely with others. Or massive problems. And I think, um, I think that's just a, that's not a political observation. That's just a, like a sociological observation. And, and I think, a, I think a lot of those statements can, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was just saying any group of humans would do that. Yeah. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I I think that the part where everyone can clasp hands is over the fact that the university system is like pretty cynical and business orientated and like exploitative of uh, like you know postdoctoral labor. And... Right. So businesses, right, employers want you to show that you're willing to play nicely with others, right? You're willing to get along, not be too weird and be willing to submerge your own opinions and your own preferences to play nicely with the group. A little bit more from this show, Decoding the Group. really seems to, every time he has a big appearance, like on Rogan or whatever, he has to tear up at some point. He's just talking about Jordan Peterson. It's like, he's not very well. He's a very, he's a very odd man, like in so many respects. And yeah, it's a, yeah, I think he's got progressively stranger, but he's, he's definitely now, if somebody regards him as his role, the role model now, and they're still watching what he's doing, it's kind of like, I don't know that there's that much hope <laughs> left. Mm. Mm. But I think this whole kind of like sort of rabbit going down a rabbit hole thing. So it sounds really like um, stupid from the outside, but when you're, I, I sort of realized that as I was kind of, so what happened was that I, I lost my job because of COVID lockdowns. Um, mm. So I think is people don't really, if it's not affected you, you don't it doesn't sort of um right if if your life was you know severely diminished uh if you lost your your job i mean through covert lockdowns there are all sorts of incentives for, for why you'd be much more likely to believe in uh conspiracy theories you don't sort of realize how big a thing it is so it's kind of that sort of being vulnerable being stuck in this situation and not knowing what's going to happen next makes you more skeptical about um like what's going on who's got your best interests at heart and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I mean, I was kind of lucky enough that I got a new job fairly re- fairly quickly after that. And so I kind of I've gradually, gradually start to move away from this kind of content. But I think what the what Decoding the Gurus is, is different from the stuff that I would kind of listen to before was more, you know, like majority of report. Apart oh. from being like so, so, so focused on um, American politics is that it's just, it just takes piss out of people. And yeah. so... And if and if there's one area which you think okay maybe I agree with them about you know American you know medical insurance or guns or whatever you agree with them but then they say something really exaggerated about like transgenderism or about like um, I don't know vaccine forcing people to get vaccines or whatever and then you kind of can't really fully subscribe to it because you feel like they're they're so and especially with the majority report now I can't I can't watch them because they're just they don't give people the benefit of the doubt and they're really vitriolic. So I think it's really much more useful to really look at what are these people actually saying and what is true and what is um, just complete exaggeration. So. Yeah, that, I, I think, yeah, you go ahead, Matt. You've been silent. <laughs> I was just going to say it's true, isn't it? Like like if, if you've lost your job as a result of the COVID lockdowns, and a lot of people did, um, and, you know, it, it hits differently than if you're someone that's just, oh, I'm working from home now for yeah. a little while. Right. I mean, COVID didn't, didn't affect, didn't negatively affect my life. Like I enjoyed the opportunity to just read more. And I mean, I, I'm on easy street compared to tens of millions of people who intensely suffered from the lockdowns. So of course, being open to the lockdowns were a good idea as I am open to, to that. You know, I'm not committed to it, but from the available evidence, it seems to me that in general, the, the lockdowns at certain times were, were a good idea, but I didn't suffer from the COVID lockdowns. Oh, and, um, and I was one of the lucky ones. I could just work from home and it was no big deal. Basically experienced no impact from it whatsoever. But I could hear secondhand from heaps of people who were like really adversely affected by it. And it takes, it's true what you say, it takes actually a leap of, a leap of empathy to go, okay, that's not happening to me. But I can imagine that if that was me, then that would be quite bad. And, you know, when people are in difficult situations, that's when you're more receptive to people going, well, you know, you know, if, if there's someone saying, look, this is all a crock of shit, this was all totally unfair, this shouldn't have happened to you, you know, then that's obviously a message that's going to, that, that, that's going to appeal. Yeah. So, um, yeah. You're just in, in that yeah, short time, you're like, you don't know where the, you know, where, where's there, your salary going to come from? Where are you going to pay the bills? You know? Right. The, these are three PhDs speaking, right? These are three academics, all right? People who, you know, generally center left. But this woman saying, due to the devastation of COVID lockdown, she started to entertain many of the conspiracy theories on the right. Not thinking about like what's the best policy for 
oh yeah maybe i don't need to buy food because um you know to stop some people getting infected with the virus you know those things happen all the time um you have to make those kind of sacrifices but it just feels like you know why why you know why me <laughs> sounds really I, no i i, I... I think that's very understandable and like a part, you know, a, a, a kind of intuitive and reasonable reaction to that situation. And I, I think that like uh, in the positive aspects, the, the some of the people that we cover do express, you know, like genuine sympathy for people in those. And um, and I think people notice that. But on the other hand, it's like I, I also see a cynical expectation of of people who are genuine. So, yeah, some people think I, I hate my viewers and that I lack uh empathy and sympathy 